soon the channel will be live. And it is. So, hello everyone, and welcome to Watching 100 Movies. I'm Christiana Ellis. I'm Mike McCain. And tonight we are continuing, concluding even, our special series, Bond vs. Impossible, Part 3, where we are comparing and contrasting the James Bond films and the Mission Impossible films. And we have now watched all of the movies we originally set out to watch. So this time for James Bond, we watched License to Kill, GoldenEye, and Casino Royale. And then for Mission Impossible, the remaining two of the Mission Impossible movies that we had not yet watched, Rogue Nation and Fallout. So, yeah. um, I, I feel like the average of in, enjoyment I had of the movies was the highest for this part compared to the other parts for me. Just in terms, yeah. if I were to, you know, give an arbitrary numerical score to each movie, I feel like this, these five had the highest average for me. I would agree. Um, I, I honestly think it's been steadily going up. Mm -hmm. I think the second round was a little bit more entertaining than the first round. Yeah. Um, and then this round, I agree, was, was a little bit more entertaining, entertaining than both of the other two. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, in, in particular, I feel like both of the first parts each had a movie that I don't think, you know, neither of us were especially enthusiastic about. You know, Mission Impossible 2 in, per, in part one is not the best. Um, and then I think both of us were a little bit lukewarm on Never Say Never Again last time. But uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy all five of the movies that we're talking about tonight. Yes. Um, yeah, because even the the one, parts that are a little dated in some of the the James Bond ones, like they just they fit so well with the time when the movies were made that it mm -hmm. made it almost like there's a little bit of nostalgic enjoyment to it. Right. You know, like License to Kill just feels very much like an '80s movie. Mm -hmm. You know, there just there are things in it outside of the Bond parts of it that just give it that kind of a sense to it and GoldenEye feels very it's a 90s movie right yeah um well so it was uh License to Kill I think was 1989 and then GoldenEye uh whoops if I could type it right I could look it up 95 because there, yeah. there was a big gap because there was a whole bunch of legal problems in between between Warner Brothers and I guess, uh, you know, various other entities involved with the rights and everything. And so uh, originally Timothy Dalton was going to be in more and not just have uh, just two and this be his last one. But uh, it took so long that he decided he, um, I, I read a couple of different accounts. One was that it just took so long that he just kind of got tired of waiting. And uh, another one was like, well, it's been so long that we want you to sign on for like a bunch more, not just one or two more. And he was like, eh, maybe not. Yeah. I mean, my understanding was there was some, there was sort of the part of the dispute was that he was enjoying doing it, but he wanted to be careful that it did not define his whole career and mm -hmm. finding like that sweet spot of how many they were willing to have him commit to versus how many he wanted to was just, they never could come to agreement with that. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah. It's it's funny that you put it that way uh, in terms of like defining his career because one of the things that I was amused to realize as I watched this one is that even though I have seen and enjoyed Timothy Dalton in lots of things, I kept seeing him in this one and going, hey, it's the grocery store guy from Hot Fuss. <laughs> Um, that, that role became so iconic in my brain that even though I've actually enjoyed him in things since then, um, that's still, I guess, the go-to reference for me, uh, when I think of Timothy Dalton. Um, but, uh, yeah, in any case though, uh, so for me, James Bond did not define his career. Instead, it was a movie he did much later. Um, yeah. but so let's. We're, we're already eager to 
get into stuff. But so let's let's try to maintain some semblance of our our structure for for these discussions because otherwise we could just you know mm -hmm. we could freewheel it and we'll probably do that at some point. But we'll let's make an attempt. So. Um, Shall we go ahead and start with the James Bond movies, you think, and talk about, like, what's similar about these three and then what's different? Yep. Okay. Um, one of the things that uh, I kept noticing each time uh, is the iconic opening credits sequences and James Bond song. I feel like there is a lot more stylistic similarity of the three here compared to some of the other James Bond movies we've watched. Yeah. Um, you know, lots of the uh, silhouettes and, and all that. Although I guess Casino Royale, I don't think had the naked lady silhouettes. Or did I don't it? Remember no, that, I think because it's all the cartoons and the bad guys who break into the, like the, the, the card symbol. Yeah. Um, shapes. And so I don't, yeah, but uh, both Golden Eye and License to Kill definitely had naked lady silhouettes. And, and in fact, not even all the way silhouetted in a couple of cases. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's what I was going to say is, you know, with these movies, like they're one of the things that, you know, that that plays into, which I think is also one of my similarities, but also one of my differences is that, like I was talking about earlier, these movies are so tied in with like the, theme of the time and like that was very much in the 80s and, and early 90s like that was right when you know that was becoming something you could have in a mainstream movie was a little bit more nudity and things like that and they kind of they really leaned into that in the in the opening credits mm -hmm. it's also what makes one of the things that's very different about these movies is that all three of them feel stylistically completely different mm -hmm. um and each one was well license to kill obviously was not um Timothy Dalton's first one. I mean, it was early enough in his that it well, was still because he only did two, right? So, right, yeah. exactly. So, mm -hmm. but the idea being, st which I still think still is comparatively with all of them, is that each one of these represents a pivot in the James Bond franchise. Mm -hmm. uh, so stylistically, they they end up being very different, even though the the concept is the same in that they're trying to be different than what was before them, right? But by token of that, they yeah. end up being different from each other. Well, yeah. you know, I couldn't really, I don't really remember very much about The Living Daylights, which was Timothy Dalton's first Bond movie. So uh, as you recall, is License to Kill a pivot from that? Or do you just mean Timothy Dalton's brief sojourn as Bond in general? Yes. And, and it ha hasn't been a while, but I do think that this one tried to take uh, the direction that they were moving with the living daylights. Like, I think he still had a few one liners in that one, mm -hmm. uh, but they, they played so strange coming from him that they almost eliminated them from yeah. this movie. Yeah. Um, he played it very, very serious, but, it, but it worked for what they were trying to do. And, I, mm -hmm. and so that's the only thing I think was a little different is that they, he, they were still trying to kind of have him do that. And then when they go, obviously with, with Pierce Brosnan, they go fully back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although, and, I have yeah. to say, I mean, I think for my personal take on it, I think Brosnan sells the quippy one-liners better than in any other Bond, personally. I I, okay. I, th I think they feel the most natural coming from him, um, personally. But uh, that's, that's subjective, I suppose. Um, but I, I think you're right, though, that it was kind of fascinating watching these three because you really see the high tide and low tide of how much they're going for grounded realism versus cartoony um, silliness, right? Like you just you really see the ebb and flow of that tendency um, yep. in these three movies. Um, so I, I think that you're you're that's an interesting uh, observation, I think, because on, on the one hand, you could you could call that a difference in the sense that they're stylistically different from one another, but that they all are pivots from what came before is, I think, a good observation. Yeah, because it certainly wasn't um, like the you know the the tendency in these movies is not like a sine wave, right? You know, if uh, if we want to say that Goldeneye is a very heightened, more silly or cartoony one, not as a critical, like I'm not saying that as a criticism, but just as a, that's what it's going for. 
Um, it's not like they got less that way over the Brosnan's tenure, right? And honestly, I think they got more. Yeah, you know, the, no, I agree. The, right. The the goofiness of the, you know, the the massive end set, you know, all the things mm -hmm. that are kind of we've always associated with Bond, like these movies. I mean, this one has it obviously with the late with the laser satellite or ray thing or whatever mm -hmm. they're at at the end under, that's underneath the lake and all that but as they get they get even weirder with like these ice palaces and yeah all sorts of, yeah crazy things um but yeah they definitely got sillier and sillier throughout the brosnan ones mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. um but, but yeah but so you're, you're absolutely right though that license to kill I mean, that one was coming right after uh, Moore's tenure, right? Like, if we if yeah. we think of Never Say Never Again as kind of an anomaly off by yeah. itself there. Um, so, Yeah, the his... two that were canon before that were Octopussy and then View to a Kill, which were Moore's last two. Mm -hmm. So, certainly, I, you're right. I, and I think one of the things that we can reflect on in terms of the Bond franchise in general is that it reinvents itself frequently. Right. It, it does feel very much like, you know, there there's a core there, but the presentation and execution of that, those core ideas can vary dramatically. And, and, you know, the there's been a large spectrum over the years. You know, so I, I think that's that's a good point, even in terms of, uh, uh, you know, similarities, just in the sense that it, it's a frequent change. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think the the other thing, another thing that's I think common about all three of these is that it's it, it's a little bit like what you were saying about like one is really an '80s movie and one is really a '90 movies '90s movie. I think that there is a conscious effort in all three of these to center bond in what's going on at the time the movie is being made as opposed to telling a more timeless story or one that's set in a past time right like it's you know in license to kill let's have james bond dealing with what people care about today and in in golden eye we have like let's actually bring in a, a female M who calls Bond on his bullshit. Um, and then we kind of have that same sort of thing in Casino Royale, because even though Brosnan's Bond started with that element, it kind of lost sight of any criticism of him in that way over his tenure. <laughs> um, but then we get back to it a little bit in a less smarmy way with Casino Royale. You know, but... <laughs> Yeah, and I was going to say, in addition to that, the villains are very much timely uh, mm -hmm. to that as well. Like, drug cartels are were, you know, obviously a very timely villain for the 80s, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. late 80s especially. And then the kind of restart of the Russian threat was very much, you know, sort of, there was that lull post-Cold War before, like, Russia became a superpower again. And this is kind of cap capitalizing right on the beginning of that. And then Casino Royale, obviously, it was a, he's an arms dealer, right? Um, um, yeah, he's an arms dealer, but it's almost less about even the 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 weapons and more just like the money, right? Right, which, which is timely for kind of how what arms dealers kind of became. Then, like, there was less of a you know the, sort of that run and gun thing, and more of a high 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 net worth kind of industry, you know, yeah. that kind of post. Like this idea of someone who really is not a true believer in any particular cause. They're just literally in it for making lots of money and they're amoral about it. Yes. Um, yeah. Which is one thing that uh, we're going to talk about uh, later for sure, which is that I feel like Casino Royale is the first Bond movie where it's really obvious that you're getting cross-pollination from the Mission Impossible movies by then. Right. I think that's the one where we start seeing the interconnected, right? Because it's obvious that the Mission Impossible movies have always had Bond influence in them, right? But I think Casino Royale is where we see a little bit of it come, going back the other way. Um, yeah. 
yeah so but we can talk more about that too um uh, but yeah like all three of these um maybe in part because they're establishing so you know like even though it was dalton's second one he's still very new to it compared to Moore, who had done a whole bunch of them um and then brosnan's first one and then craig's first one uh, it's very much the idea of we're introducing a new guy, but he's still supposed to be the same original guy. Um, although that's almost a difference with Casino Royale too, because I think is Casino Royale the first one to actually kind of try to do a time reset. It's the first one that that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, where it's sort of because it's it, it basically one of the things is I, you know that that's really interesting about that one is that it it took a ton of influence from the first book. It just updated it to 2006. Mm -hmm. So it does use the parts where he becomes the double O and he kind of gets promoted into that. So it's, it's almost like an origin story, which was again, speaking of movies of the time, you know, the mid two thousands is kind mm -hmm. of when reboots and origin stories kind of kicked off. So this is very timely in that sense too. But you know, to, to the short answer to your question, I don't remember another one that, that, tries to reboot him back to the beginning like that. Mm -hmm. In fact, there, there's probably more often um, quips about the other guy, um, you know, and, and almost insider referencing to the fact that like the same guy could continue to be 007. Like it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's the, it's almost like a, I don't want to say Jason Bourne. That's not exactly right, but it's kind of like that in that, you know, it's sort of a alias that anybody takes that whoever gets promoted to this role takes mm -hmm. on this person, this person's persona. Right. Whereas Casino Royale doesn't really treat it like that. It treats it like it's its own new story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Cause I, I think that, you know, that's a bit of a difference uh, for Casino Royale, but it, it's a similarity in the sense that all three are kind of trying to establish uh, this this new person, e even though like again it was Dalton's second one still, but there I think they had a lot of inertia to uh, to overcome, and and in some ways uh, maybe License to Kill was a little bit more like the he settled in a little bit more now, and so this is more his thing instead of uh, being you know like in transition. Yeah. Uh, so I, let's actually just briefly, in case it's been a while since anyone has uh, seen them, we can kind of just maybe briefly recap the, the plot of, of each. Um, sure. Especially just because I know that, like we had this problem last time. Some of them start to blur together a little bit. <laughs> like, wait, which action sequence was which in, in which one? Uh, but so in License to Kill, we have... Um, uh, it, it's, it's basically straight up revenge plot, right? Because we have Felix Leitner just gets married and he's, you know, he's, he's a new guy again. And so d in Moore's era, didn't they have, they had Felix uh, be black and then they changed it again. Is that, am I right about that? Yes. Okay. I guess, you know, I, I just, uh, I, when I saw Felix in this one and just coming from like the previous movies, I was like, wait, Wait a minute. I guess that was maybe not inherent to the character necessarily, but uh, so in any case, uh, Felix uh, it has just gotten married, um, and we get a big cold open with uh, a, a pretty awesome actual skydive of uh, Bond as best man and Felix uh, skydiving into his own wedding ceremony at, uh, at in Key West, which is pretty fun. Uh, but then the they had. Uh, interfered with the actions of a drug cartel. So they kill Felix's new wife and uh, maim him. Um, and now Bond wants revenge and he has to go rogue in order to do it because MI6 basically explicitly tells him, do, do not do that. You are not allowed to do that. And so it's, I think it was interesting that, uh, that in that one, really what it is is James Bond trying to assassinate someone out of personal revenge against the wishes of what his uh, country wants. Um, well, and I, very much there's, there's a, you know, I guess we're not at that part yet about how they're similar to Mission Impossible, but you did bring mm -hmm. up one earlier. But Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I, th I think we can mention The that idea, again. though, that he it's very Mission Impossible-like mm -hmm. that, you know, he is revoked of his license to kill and he is no longer, he's basically operating rogue. Yeah. You know, which is obviously a key thing that happens frequently in Mission Impossible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty regularly. <laughs> yeah. um, like, even, uh, like... Like even w like what we saw with uh, Ghost Protocol last time was that uh, you know it was sort of a wink wink like you're not officially on this mission wink wink gosh it would be a shame if you escaped from this car wink you know <laughs> but uh, yeah in any case though uh, uh, and so then the rest of the movie is basically him you know uh, recruiting some allies and getting most of them killed in order to try to get his revenge on on this uh, drug dealer which he eventually does also benicio del toro is in it is the you know l little baby benicio who gets uh, thrown into a, a cocaine brick grinder <laughs> yeah. that was actually another one of the things i was going to mention about that but it being kind of a late 80s movie is that the the sort of flamboyant pseudo gory deaths Mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. that are were kind of inherent into a lot of movies at that time yeah so so here's the thing just as a brief like personal history with james bond like license to kill i think is probably the first one i actually ever saw but i also saw it when it was just a guy right and i didn't really have any sense of james bond as like a legacy character um, and so I think, I think of as Pierce Brosnan as being like my first bond, even though I definitely saw license to kill first, but, uh, but I totally remembered that guy getting blown up in the barometric pressure chamber, <laughs> which science, uh, trivia that totally would not happen, but, uh, um, but it was fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very silly, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's funny because uh, in a movie that's otherwise so grounded, it's 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 like you could definitely kill someone with those one of those chambers, but they would not literally have their face blow up like a balloon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have you have that. You have obviously what we just talked about, the cocaine grinder and mm -hmm. then the uh, shark attack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, honestly, the the um, counterweight. Uh, with the guy and the shark and the meat, it, like was like pretty clever for how really straightforward and simple it is. And actually, that's one of the things that really stood out to me in License to Kill was that, like, it's not that it looks low budget, but a lot of the setups are much more simple and straightforward, but not in an unclever way. It's just that it's not quite so you know, pie in the sky uh, concept, right? Hmm? Grandiose, I was going to say. That's, yeah. Yes, yes, good word. Um, everything is much more straightforward and yet all just works really well. So I kind of, I actually looked up just to see if it was a lower budget than the others just because it's, you know, it, it, and, it and it's not really, but uh, it, it just, you don't see like a, a desire for huge, big, Spect uh, spectacle in terms of the special effects. Everything is kind of more grounded. Yeah, um, it definitely has a, a kind of a raw feel to it, mm -hmm. um, just in general. Yeah. Which I really enjoy about it. I mean, I, I really like this movie. Oh, um, no, I do too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely I did. Um, and then... Yeah. Uh, well, well, I was going to say, just to, to kind of continue off of your talking about, like, your first watch. So I used to watch all the James Bonds, you know, much more frequently, Mike, um because I used to do like marathons on like TBS or something of mm -hmm. them, like on holiday weekends and stuff. And my dad was a really big fan of both the books and the movies. And so we would watch those together. So I have a lot of memories of just watching James Bond with him. So by the time I got to this one, I was pretty well versed in it. Um, but, you know, being that this movie came out, I mean, I mean, I, I was like 11 or whatever, but I mean, I watched it much more frequently after that, but this one I have a lot of memories of. This was the first one where, like, I was kind of coming of age and getting interested in girls part of it, a mm -hmm. uh, part of my life. And so these Bond girls, you know, while they are not um, as memorable in character as some of the other ones, these were two that really, like, I don't know, they just really interested me. 
Um, and I think, again, it was just because of the timing of them being, you know, because even with that time, if I went back and watched one from the 70s, like it's it looked like girls from the 70s. You know, this was more of like mm-hmm. girls I was around and like, you know, that kind of a thing. And so I don't know, for some reason, these two have always been two of my favorites, even though they're not particularly, you know, interesting. Well, yeah, but it's just it's just a personal memory thing. Yeah. Know? Pam Bouvier in particular, just as far as, you know, we sometimes talk about glow ups, that sort of uh, term, you know, like not that she looked bad when he meets her with the, you know, when she has the shoulder length hair and everything, but, you know, he's pretty much determined, okay, I needed you to get out of a certain area with a, with, cause you had a plane, but now I think it's too dangerous for you. So I'm trying to get rid of you. But then she gives herself the makeover to be his, uh, his executive assistant and boy when she shows up in that suit with the new short haircut it's like whoo <laughs> she looks pretty good yeah she did and mm-hmm. you know and and i like that they were they were very different um you know and that they they both well again and i don't want to take away from their characters by saying they're not some of the more memorable ones they're not as cartoonishly memorable. right yeah like no like yeah. ridiculous puns in the name as we will get to when we get back to golden Yes, exactly. There's none of that. Um, and they, they both have, you know, they both have their own story. They both mm-hmm. have some agency in what they're doing, but they both, and they, but they both are very just different in the style of what they approach and, and kind of his interest level with them, which I love, I love the delivery at the end because like you think that he's going to go for the one who's kind of like the sexier, you know, more, you know, higher class or whatever, you know, she just has this kind of model feel to her. And then you've got, you know, uh, what is it? Pam Bouvier, who's, you know, much more hardcore. Like, I mean, she looks great, but she's a little tougher, a little Mm -hmm. bit more of a fighter, you know, she's kind of more in the trenches with him. And when he ends up choosing her, which they don't really tip that Mm -hmm. until the end when he's kind of got both of them there and he's like, Oh, like you should meet the general and (laughs) whatever. And then he runs off. Like, it's just funny. It's a great... Well, and he, just, like, jumps off a waterfall into a pool to catch up with the pan. Yeah, right? like, the whole thing yeah. was, like, for a movie that didn't have a lot of silliness, like, that little bit of silliness at the mm-hmm. end, uh, like, with, with them, I thought was really fun. Yeah. You know, I liked it a lot. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's interesting, I think, about Dalton's Bond is that he he absolutely has a menace to him when he turns that side of himself on, right? You know, like he, this is a revenge movie. So there's plenty of it where he is in badass mode. But I feel like when he shifts it to playful, it feels um, like this is not an acting criticism of Brosnan, but it feels more genuine, like there's a, like a re- realness to the emotion. Whereas Brosnan's is a little bit glib. And I think that's on purpose. I don't think that's a failing in Brosnan's acting. But Brosnan, even when he's being kind of playful, still feels like you're only getting a centimeter in. You don't really see what's going on inside. Yes, and I think that's by, by design. Yeah. Um, but, but to be fair, I mean, I think just on credentials, you know, it, it, Dalton is, is the best traditional actor out of all of these bonds you know um you know he he was much 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 more a stage actor uh most of his early television stuff was all shakespearean Mm -hmm. pbs style kind of dramas and period pieces and things like that he's just a much more classical actor and so he just has a a a level of training or a a style of training that's a little bit different than anybody else in this role Mm -hmm. um that i think is part of what you're reacting to there too because like he can really turn that menace up, um, mm-hmm. you know, from having played, you know, again, bad guys in Shakespearean dramas, like here, there's a, you know, you, but he's able to dial it back enough. So it doesn't feel mm-hmm. like that. You know, I, I, I just think he's a really good actor. I mean, right. you know, you know. well, so like, I think what I'm talking about with Brosnan is more uh, something that they, they, they make the, the subtext into text in Casino Royale. Like there's the bit, where uh, Bond is in the hospital in Casino Royale and Vesper's with him and she starts trying to talk about plans with him, but then she's like, oh, okay, there it is. The armor's back up, I see. You know, and, and he's basically, you know, and, and it's just this element of like, 
Bond, I think, as a character is written to be a person for whom he can be pleasant and civil and even playful, but you feel like you're really only getting surface level personality with him and the real person inside is protected and is not available to you. Um, and in, in particular with, with Casino Royale, you know, what we see is a story where they're explicitly trying to establish that he has those tendencies to begin with, but they are locked in because when he makes himself more open, he gets basically karma, you know, like cosmically punished for it. And, uh, and we can see why he wouldn't be like that anymore afterwards. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so in any case, um, let's let's just as plot synopsis goes. Um, uh, Golden Eye, uh, you want to try? You want to take that one? Yeah. So it's um, basically the idea behind it is that there's this um, you know fancy <clears throat> Russian uh, satellite a laser array thing that was it shuts down uh, electronics or something like that? I can't remember exactly yeah, what it Yeah, well, it's like they say it's an EMP and it kind of does that, but we also see it causing a lot of conventional explosions for no apparent reason. Yes. So it's just a very bad satellite, uh, yeah. you know, weapon of war in, you know, in the time period of Star Wars and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. It just kind of plays off of all of those ideas. Um, and what ends up happening is that uh, it gets, you know, we think there's only one. Um, it gets, you know, ex trans executed or something like that. It ends up blowing up its own um, kind of operating area, mm -hmm. which allows the people who, you know, were, were, who are making the plot to essentially get rid of everybody who kind of has an idea about what these golden eye satellites do. And then we find out there's actually a second one then they're planning, you know, again, to what are we, cause chaos in the world, you know, same kind mm -hmm. of idea is that they're going to use this thing to um, base, uh, what is it, London, I think that they're going to target yeah. it on and, and shut down the financial markets and, mm -hmm. you know, and therefore the, you know, people who are kind of insulated from it become not only are they wealthy, but then when they shut down the traditional financial markets and they become exponentially more wealthy. Right. So it, you know, it's it's the, not only chaos for the sense of chaos, but also for the I become very rich. And now I'm starting to think, am I also talking about one of the Mission Impossible plots? Well, like, y yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but but I, I, I want to I, because I you definitely are because I was actually going to say that, too, is because the, the piece that you kind of didn't mention is that the ultimate bad guy in GoldenEye is an X double O. Yeah, yeah, where. Right. Thought yeah. left for dead, for fairly reasonably, we see the scene, and it's it's clear that Bond would have no reason to expect that uh, Sean Bean's character is still alive. Like they're like, it makes no sense that he would be, and so there's no, like I honestly, uh, Sean Bean's character's rationalization for why he's mad at Bond is pretty stupid. Like or well, the, well no, that, we we could buy that he would feel that way, but it's completely unreasonable from any objective standpoint. Right, and from a plot synopsis standpoint, what he's saying is that he was expecting Bond to set the the timers that were going to kind of blow up and cover their tracks at six minutes, mm -hmm. but then Bond moved him down to three because he wanted to get away and he thought his partner was dead. Yeah, and that ultimately made it so that the guy who we were reasonably believed was dead could not escape and ends up having his face burned in the explosion. Or, yeah. You know, this kind of stuff so he's mad about that I, you're right and that's the problem sometimes watching these movies is that i actually i watched all the bonds first and then i watched the mission impossible second together mm -hmm. and so i you know i left an imprint on my brain of like uh, things that were similar so yeah, yeah. I, I can't believe i completely forgot mm -hmm. which although when we get into similarities there's another yeah. Well, yeah. So there, there's, a, there's a <laughs> so couple. Sean's character does, does have another translation to Mission Impossible, but anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but, but so t to be he sure, he wants revenge. Yeah. He wants money, and he wants to cause chaos. So he sort right. of has this uh, three pronged approach to why he wants to use the satellite um, to do it, and mm -hmm. um, ultimately, one, you know, there's the the other girl out, you know, who there's a girl who escapes. You know, there are two people who get out of this facility. One is working with the bad guys on the, as a programmer, 
The other is just a lower level programmer who manages to escape and Bond ends up, uh, you know, they end up bringing her in and picking her up and bringing mm-hmm. her as part of the mission. And she's kind of assisting Bond to yeah. try to defeat she, her. She's the good Bond, good Bond girl yeah. as opposed to the bad Bond girl. Right. Yeah. She's the good Bond girl. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's helping Bond at, from this programming standpoint um, battle this other programmer. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of very, again, back to the 90s thing, a lot of this sort of hackerish type stuff where yeah, it's kind of yeah. silly and well, doesn't really work the way these things work and they're just kind of inventing things that are happening this, and this yeah. movie borrows <laughs> a lot of plot points from a lot of different movies in in a way that I'm not even really being critical as much as I think it's silly to pretend it's not happening because first of all what's his face the other hacker's whole shtick of having a little cartoony version of his face and all of the uh, all of the, the 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 games that he plays with the hacking and everything, uh, it's uh quite a bit like uh, Nedry from Jurassic Park, which came out two years before this. Yes, it's not just a little bit similar; <laughs> it's very similar. Um, yes. but, but there's wait. really things like, like the fact that, like you said, he has these like word games to, that mm-hmm. that are his passwords. Yeah, that end up having like a one word five letter answer, which it's yeah. like. Even then, passwords were more complicated than that if you were at that level. Like, well, you, didn't, you, don't, yeah. you don't encrypt a bunch of nuclear codes with the word chair. Right. You know, or, <laughs> well, especially when one is that he is doing it in one particular circumstance as a mind game, a playful mind game that has nothing to do with anything. And then the other one is the super secret top, you know, right. top notch world changing uh, like terrorist attack. You know, it's like, right. oh, no, yeah, you use the same password for everything. Sure. Um, yeah. But in any it's case, that nobody knows exists right. as the same mind game password as uh, yeah. this other thing. Yeah. But but uh, so we'll talk more about how Sean Bean's villain in this movie is actually extremely similar in a number of ways to the villain that spans the two Mission Impossible movies. Because, you know, although Solomon Lane doesn't have a personal connection to Ethan Hunt the way Sean Bean's character did with Bond what they're doing is pretty similar. Yes. Um, But in any case, uh, the other thing that I was going to mention as being very similar in, in Goldeneye here is the whole thing of, sure, we're going to blow up all the financial records, but only right after we transfer a whole lot of money into our account. Um, And so we're blowing up everything to erase the history of that. And so uh, Bond's just saying, so you're nothing more than a petty thief. And I was just waiting for him to say, no, I'm an exceptional thief, just like in Die Hard, where it's the same thing. And it's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he doesn't say that because yeah. Sean Bean um, is not um, uh, Hans Gruber. No. But then ultimately, like, we should just still talk about that this culminates in them finding out there's another satellite Mm -hmm. and trying to track down the new base that they are running the new satellite from, which turns out to be a antenna array that is hidden underneath a lake. Yeah, it's very Um, cool. (laughs) Yeah, in Cuba, um, where it the lake can drain and the antenna array can raise up out of the lake to, Mm -hmm. to start the satellite and... It's just such a cool set. Yeah, um, yeah. And we, you know, whether we talk about it more or not, I think we would be remiss not to discuss the fact that this um, movie helped launch, you know, one of the most modern first-person multiplayer shooters. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, this took them out of that sort of Doom kind of, you know, era into... The, just the much more realistic spy based, you know, modern weapons, mm-hmm. uh, cool story and, and locations, um, interesting characters as your avatars, you know, uh, multiplayer functionality, mm-hmm. you know, just all the things that we think of as just kind of commonplace with a, with a Call of Duty game right now, uh, all had, you know, some, oh, all owe something to the game that came from this movie. Mm-hmm. And the movie has, well, the movie doesn't feel like a movie made about to sell a first-person shooter. It certainly doesn't. It, it 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 equates very well with it by having these really cool set designs and mm-hmm. like places where you can run around shooting in lots of different guns. You know, he's not only using his Walter PK. He's also picking up 
Uzis and AK 47s. Like he's, he's finding guns the way that you do in a first person shooter. You know, Mm -hmm. you, you pick up guns from, from your villain and you have a new gun, you know, and he's always constantly changing and upgrading. Like it's, and again, I don't know how much of that was conscious and how much of it was just kind of like, this is a cool thing that then translated into the shooter. Um, but it is, it is so inherent in this movie. Like you can't get away from it. Yeah. You know? Like, and there, yeah, there's so much to that. Cause um, obviously doom and doom two were, were very popular before GoldenEye, but there was an element to which I think they were less accessible for the mainstream, maybe because of the content, like the subject matter. Like just, you know, the gore and demon stuff and everything that I think maybe there are some people who were not going to be into it for that reason. But then something about GoldenEye was just a little bit more like like everyone could like that. And, uh, you know, if we were doing a video game uh, show, there's all sorts of stuff we could talk about there too, where um, like the whole idea that there would be one character that in the multiplayer that is so different in how it plays from all of the others that it starts inspiring the discussions of like, what does it mean to have multiplayer balance and everything? And, you know, you have golden eye tournaments where you have to say no one gets to play his odd job because they, they, he has a smaller character model and he's literally harder to hit um, than any of the other characters, which is bizarre also just because the character of odd job is not short. So yeah. why is the, why is the odd job model in that golden eye short well we could i you know there's lore about that but but yeah i'm I'm glad you brought that up because i wasn't probably gonna think to bring it up but i think you're right that there that was a kind of a lasting legacy in fact i i think in some circles the game is probably more memorable than the movie even yeah i mean it's a phenomenal game and but to your point yeah i mean just the because what was it you could get a the golden gun which was a one shot one kill Mm. and so if you had odd job and the golden gun, like you were virtually unstoppable. Right. Well, because uh, <laughs> like I think for every other character, if you're aiming straight, you could shoot them uh, like down a hallway or whatever. But for odd job, you literally had to aim down. Like otherwise your bullet would go over the over their head. Right. So if you're odd job and you can run with a straight aim and a, and a one shot, one kill, no one can ever aim at you. They don't have time. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah. Thing, like, the movie, while also inspiring the video game, I just say it's part of the movie as well. Like just if you think about how how many different guns he uses and all these different shootouts in very different scenarios, like they're, they're, it's it it's very much like I said, one, whether they were kind of however they did it. I'm not sure the the you know, the exact timeline of both, but they're very much linked, hmm. you know, how, and how the feel of the game and how the feel of the movie are. So. Yeah. Um, plus, uh, I I think the 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 two most memorable things from uh, the movie for me were were uh, like the the big set piece at the radar you know the radio telescope dish, uh, but also uh, Bond driving the tank around. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say there was yeah. that was the last thing I was gonna put in the plot is that there is a epic tank car chase. Yeah. Well, and the part where he plows right through the statue's base and so then he's riding around with this gigantic metal statue <laughs> on top of the tank <laughs> my favorite is the part where he like you know basically like drifts the tank to like take sharp turns and stuff like i don't know that tanks can do that i don't know that they can't but it was kind of cool <laughs> yeah you know i'm not really sure either i think that um tanks you know we think of them as slow because they're so heavy but i think that some tanks actually can be pretty fast if they were ever to be driven that way and i think just generally they often wouldn't be because that's not very safe <laughs> yeah, I just but, don't know uh, with, with the, the tread thickness that they have, like whether they could actually drift yeah, like, I don't... into it, you know, but whatever. It, it was fun, so I don't mm-hmm. really care. If oh, yeah, no. but I'm not going to try. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so uh, that uh, yeah, that's a pretty good synopsis, I think, uh, of, of GoldenEye. And um, so and then uh, Casino Royale, you know, we talked a little bit already about, you know, we've got this bad guy who is, you know, basically... He's an arms dealer, but uh, he's also an arms dealer for a larger organization. And I think that's one thing that's a little bit unique maybe about uh, Lashif as a villain is that like 
he is he is a bad guy who's already actually kind of on the outs with even more powerful people. And so part of what makes him a threat in this movie is that he is he's desperate um, because he's already kind of messed some stuff up or or rather, you know, whether he messed it up or whether Bond messed it up for him is, a <laughs> you know, uh, debatable. Right. But uh, that it's established that although he's kind of the primary guy we're after at the beginning, it's made very clear up front that he is, you know, he's not the head of his organization. And he has other, you know, equally or more powerful people that are kind of in the mix. Um, but mostly what we're doing is we're trying to track him down. And, you know, it's interesting because I was going to say it's relatively low stakes compared to some, but at the same time, it's doing a, a setup thing, which I think will be interesting when we start talking about the comparisons with um, the Mission Impossible movies, because I think there's there's an element of that there too. And I guess with um, like with License to Kill, like what are the overall stakes? It's mostly that we've got a really bad drug dealer guy who's dealing lots of drugs and making lots of money, and and we're also mad at him because he killed uh, Felix's wife and, and so like it's like a it's a more personal stakes but then in GoldenEye it's kind of like okay yeah like a lot of people are going to die and who knows what kind of chaos would result from the GoldenEye thing whereas Casino Royale it's it's again it's like well we think that this guy is the link to more stuff that's going on and there's a lot of money going on but there's not really a like a like an imminent global threat, exactly. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's meant to be much more almost character driven. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's so much, and and that's why, like, you know, the the card tournament is like such a key scene in this movie because it's sort of indicative of what the whole movie is about. Mm -hmm. is about this sort of gamesmanship between these characters and how does each person, how is each person's traits, you know, kind of come to this, you know, back and forth that they're doing and, you know, and the cat and mouse, not, that's not really the right way to say it, but the, you know, it gets very game theory, you know, and like, we're, I'm going to yeah. try this. Well, I mean, we've got that central yeah. poker game as the, as kind of the central motif, right? It's like yeah. they're, they're each trying to bluff like each other. That, that, that game is like not only just a central motif, but it's just sort of like is what the whole movie is about. Like mm -hmm. that is truly the climax, even though there is still an hour of movie after it and an hour of movie before it, you know, it is, it is the, what the movie's about, you know, yeah. it's this interaction, this, this play with each other, you know? Right. So essentially we have uh Le chief is, is trying to uh, cause terrorist threats that will produce changes in the stock market so that he can make lots of money. And in particular, he's doing this partly as a promise to invest the money from other people and make them lots of money too, by means of the same market manipulation, which again, is a, it's a, we've, you know, we've got some similarity to Solomon Lane again there. Right. But, uh, but, Bond stops him from blowing up this big prototype airplane. Uh, and so the promised uh, financial windfall uh, that Le Chief had promised to some uh, dangerous people doesn't go through because Bond stopped his plan. And so now he needs to win this money through a poker game. And then the whole goal here is to try to prevent him from getting the money that way so that he will be so desperate that he will be willing to come in and become an asset for MI6. Right. Um, but then it doesn't go that way because we've also got uh, a number of, uh, you know, betrayals and uh, complicated character things happening. Right. Which is sort of, that's why I was trying to think of, I was, I called it like cat and mouse and I knew that was wrong, but there, mm -hmm. it's, it is so much like the game theory and like, Oh, we have this great plan, but Oh, so do does this person and this person and this person and we all and they all have influence on whether or not our plan works and yeah it, <laughs> uh, yeah and so I this is you know 
Yeah, I'm I'm so excited to get into where we're actually comparing the two franchises here because they're like I just feel like there's so many really obvious parallels in some of the movies that we're talking about this week. Um, but without getting completely into that yet, what I'll say about Casino Royale that I really like is I really like Ava Green as as Vesper. I think she's great. In rewatching the movie, I had forgotten she doesn't actually show up until an hour into the movie. But uh, she's, I, I think she's great. Um, I think they do uh, her first scene with him where she's psychoanalyzing. So they're kind of psychoanalyzing each other on the train car. Um, is great from a character perspective, but it's also functional because it helps us to establish things about who this bond is. Right. For the audience, like, uh, you know, let's establish some of the things about his psychology that we can have just a character straight out say, because it makes sense in character for her to say that. And then he gets to do it back to her. So now we get to have just right out on the table all of these things about who these two characters are. But it works in a scene. It doesn't feel like exposition or character dump stuff. Um. We can take that as one of the things that is different between the movies because when in GoldenEye, when he is getting quote unquote psychoanalyzed, it, and when she's in the car and he decides to race uh, on a top, yeah, around through that whole thing. And then at the end, you know, she's yelling at him like terrified and she tells him to stop. And then he just like says something clever and now she wants to sleep with him. Like, yeah, well, yeah, he literally seduces the woman who. See, something that I, I hadn't really ever picked up on before this viewing is that one of the things that he says to her um, about, you know, why she should evaluate him well is he has no problems with female authority. And of course, the reason that's relevant is we discover, you know, a few scenes later, there's a new M played by Judy Dench now. And so that's, of course, why they would be evaluating him to see if he has problems with female authority, which he obviously does, despite yeah. his. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, let, I think much we can... as clever and useful as the analysis that you're talking about. Yeah. So as a difference in the films. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, but then again, like, I think it, it's 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 a, it's almost a difference in who the bond is. Right. You know, because I think in both scenes do kind of tell us about the character, who the character is. That's yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think we can certainly let off the brakes on talking about differences between the Bond movies. So I, 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 I only just thought of it because of you were talking about that no, particular part of it. Yeah. No, no. I, yeah. I, I, and I think it's time to do that anyway. But yeah, so I think that, you know, that scene with the, the, the car chase uh, the car race, I guess, where he seduces the the person trying to, you know, evaluate him really has to be paired with his first scene with, with Judy Dench, right? Where yeah. it's established, first of all, like our introduction to her is we have characters talking about her before she even shows up, uh, implying like she's the witch of numbers. She only cares about what the numbers say and that sort of thing. And, oh, 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 she's right behind me, isn't she? That sort of gag, right? But Judy Dench is awesome, so she just comes in and, like, even though we kind of begin... <laughs> Again, like, I, I'm i laughing just because Judy Dench is new M versus Alec Baldwin is new, <laughs> new guy in... Mission Possible well, movies. There's just so just many parallels in these movies. Like, huh? let's, get through, let's get through the rest of the Bond yeah, stuff okay. quickly, then, and we yeah. can just cover the rest in there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, like, we already talked about this a little bit in the idea of having each of these be a, a pivot being a similarity, but, like, tonally, very different, right? License to Kill, very gritty and grounded based on personal revenge. It's a dark story about, you know, the the darker side of, you know, like drugs and all of that sort of thing. And then GoldenEye is very heightened. It's all about super spies and high tech weapons and um, big set pieces. Um, and then Casino Royale literally, I mean, it, it, it grounds it dramatically all the way by literally making uh, Bond not even an established agent who's done tons of this stuff already. It makes him new. Although he's he's not brand new, like we even see in that first, um, you know, the the foot chase scene, that like he's not the green the greenest of the agents there, 
Like he has to tell his partner, stop touching your ear. Um, but uh, that one, again, makes it much more grounded. And even in terms of who Bond is, right? Because we have uh, Timothy Dalton is the much more sort of like he, like, you know, people talk, about, I've, I've not read any of the books, but people talk about Timothy Dalton was trying to be a little bit more like Bond from the books. Whereas by comparison, Brosnan, very slick, very quippy, nothing real, like even when he gets, you know, like, well, all three of them get beat up at various points in this one, but like he's, uh, you know, Brosnan, you know, we talked last time about the idea of when, when and if James Bond ever seems to feel desperate or afraid. Of these three, bon, uh, Brosnan is certainly the one that's least uh, likely to look desperate or afraid. Yeah. You know, very in control of his emotions at all times. Um, versus, and like with License to Kill, right? Like he remains relatively like cool on the exterior, but of course he's, the entire story is motivated by his desire for revenge. Um, and it's not even for like, for justice. It's literally like, no, you hurt my friend. <laughs> so I'm going to kill you. Um, and then uh, in, you know, in Casino Royale, we literally have the dumbest torture sequence ever. I love this movie. I think that sequence is very dumb. Um, but where he is literally being tortured and it's obviously very painful, but he uses the opportunity to make a borderline homophobic joke. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, let, let's just briefly talk about that scene. What is up with the chair with the, the seat cut out so he can like awkwardly swing a knot on the end of a rope up to hit him in the balls? Like, what? What is that? I love this movie. That scene is bizarre. It it is a little off from the rest of the movie. Yeah. Um, and I, I've always I, I've never really looked it up, but I, I I think I've always wondered if like maybe that is a real thing, and they just decided to use it. I, yeah. I I don't know. Um. I want to say that like this is my first time watching this movie since i have become a huge fan of mads mickelson and so i do want to say i really like him as Le chief in this movie and it is to his credit that that scene works at all because he's the one that has to sell that this is even remotely any kind of a like a thing i don't even want to say a reasonable thing but it's just like he's trying to explain it's like some people get all overcomplicated and overthink their torture when it really all it takes is the simplest. And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? That's not what's happening here. <laughs> and and I, w I think that um, a, a friend of mine I was uh, talking with this, about this uh, with uh, earlier was uh, told me that he suspected that the whole thing was to set up for James Bond's line about... Uh, you know, no, you have to hit the, hit the other one so that the world will know that you died scratching my balls. And, uh, you know, but again, like having this whole thing about like, oh, you have to worry that if you try to hold out for too long, I'm going to destroy what makes you a man. And like, I feel like that doesn't, has not aged super great. Um, uh, yeah, so that scene it really is not, that's a clunker of a scene in an otherwise great movie, I think. Um, but, you know, like, <laughs> my point really in bringing it up was not to get into that so much as um, just the idea that we have James Bond there being tortured and still not only certainly does not seem at any imminent risk of actually giving up any information, but also like making jokes even while he's in incredible pain. So that's so apparently I just I finally decided to look it up. Apparently oh, yeah? this is a real type of torture. Okay. Well, I mean I I believe that in the sense that like human beings are complicated and have 
probably found all sorts of ways to torture over the years. And so I guess I, I buy that it is something that has happened. Um, you know, it is the sort of thing that you certainly wouldn't need a lot of equipment for. But I don't know. I still don't like it. <laughs> There's also apparently a lot of fans of this scene. All right. I'm not going to read. I mean, they're mostly they just think it's the most. They say it's the most gripping scene in the whole movie. All this right. is why we love Daniel Craig and Mads Mikkelsen because they, you know, blah, blah, blah. it's there's uh, a lot of fans. About you know it, what? I I agree with you. Yeah, I mean that's that's allowed. Like I, you know, I people are allowed to like it. I it's it's a subjective thing, but it certainly yeah. I feel like. So much of the rest of the movie just really works, and then that movie just that scene just kind of feels very awkward. Like, it, I just I don't I don't like. It's one thing to say, does that kind of torture like exist? Has it been done in the world? But also, does it feel like the kind of torture that Lashif would do personally? Right. Like. Uh, it doesn't to me, but uh, well, whatever. Um, I, I'm in agreement with you. You're yeah. not trying to sell me. On yeah. It. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I yeah. It, I've always thought it was weird. Um, yeah, it just, but anyway. Mm -hmm. But in any it. case, um, so what we establish though uh, in, in that scene is that, uh, you know, Bond is right, at least in the sense that Lashif dies and uh, it seems as though, oh, victory, we actually get away. Although I think astute moviegoers will, will be curious, wait a minute, we got a victory that James Bond didn't actually do? He got rescued? And there's still half an hour of movie left? Something's up. <laughs> and sure enough, it turns out uh, that Vesper actually steals the money from him and um, had a very complicated plan. Like, I mean, I guess I kind of buy that there's a lot of conflicting stuff going on there, but it really, like, it's complicated enough that they really felt like they had to have Judy Dench essentially just explain over the phone exactly what happened, because <laughs> otherwise we would be going, what? <laughs> Wait a minute, what? <laughs> um. But so it turns out Vesper was being blackmailed all along. She was actually the one that was supposed to um, sabotage uh, Bond from, uh, you know, uh, winning the poker game. And then th when that didn't work, she was supposed to steal the money. And we guess maybe somehow she saved his life because she actually cares about him. But it's all a little bit messy. But we end up with a big, cool uh, Venice set piece at a uh, shootout where he's kind of trying, he's trying to save her, even though he kind of thinks that maybe she's, he, he, he like, he's been presented with a lot of evidence that she's, she's bad, but he doesn't completely believe it. And he's wants to talk to her, but is basically not given any really uh, real opportunity to talk with her. She essentially, I mean, it's a little overcomplicated to say, you know, oversimplified to say she kills herself, but she certainly stops him from saving her. Um, and uh, and and then so she drowns, and so we end up with a little bit of uh, a remnant of like the emotional impact of uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service with uh, with uh, Bond getting married only to have her die at the end, right? You know, for we have Bond seeming mm -hmm. tempted of maybe he will actually leave this whole secret agent thing behind. Maybe he really is in love with her. Maybe he really can open up with her. And then it turns out, oh no, she actually betrayed him for complicated reasons that maybe she was actually still in love with someone else, but she was question mark uh, still planning to run away with him or she thought she was gonna die anyway. It's all a little bit messy. And I don't want to try to complain about that because I, I feel like it works. The ambiguity is is nice, actually, in that. But uh, overall, what it feels like by the end is that this movie is attempting to establish some of the known character traits of James Bond as a legacy character, right? Is like, 
we know some of the ways that James Bond is with women. How did he get like that? Well, we start with him a little bit like that, and then we write a story that makes him more like that. Um, what other differences uh, are there there, or uh, do we want to cover before we we begin with the, you know get into the Mission Impossibles? Now, the only thing that I had that I meant to talk about on the similarities was that particularly with License to Kill and Goldeneye, they very much have the while done in different ways and very much in tune with the way the movie, style of the movie, they have the elaborate, you know, the bad guy could have just killed Bond, mm -hmm. but decided to do it in a more elaborate way. Like, you know, the, the drug dealers could have just shot him, mm -hmm. you know, but instead they put him on the cocaine belt to go into the grinder. Yeah. Um, and then, but that's, again, that's a little bit more raw and real. And then mm -hmm. you have the golden eye one where, they strap him and the programmer into a helicopter and set the missiles of the helicopter to fire and shoot, go up into space, uh, in the air, then mm -hmm. come back and blow up the helicopter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so these just elaborate, you know, things uh, are just mm -hmm. so strange, you know. Yeah, um, like with that one, it is very silly, but I, I feel like you can at least kind of say, well, you can justify that the idea was an attempt to make it look like they died in a helicopter accident. Right. Yeah. But and, the, for... and the, it, it leans in a little bit to the idea that this, there, there's a revenge piece to it. There's a couple of times where it references back to the whole idea of like, you know, uh, Oh, you have six minutes and he's like, well, that means we only have three, you know, yeah. later on, you know, and like that whole thing and like wanting him to be present Mm -hmm. for the instead of just shooting him like wanting him to be present for his own demise thing yeah. like there's a little bit of like trying to use that uh but it's again it's part of the bond franchise like I, this sort of elaborate yeah you know, I, this, I, mean, I guess the torture scene would even almost be yeah. part of like that you yeah, know as yeah. opposed to just you know killing him like he has to have this really oh, no, elaborate yeah. torture you know and and so that that but that's very much a part of bond movies you mm -hmm. know that these these movies all shared so yeah. anyway that was kind of the last thing i had in my notes that we hadn't covered yet. So. Uh, one last little thing I want to mention about License to Kill that I, I occurred to me watching this viewing is how crazy it is that Bond starts a relatively small fire in this number established in the script, $32 million drug processing facility. And the guy who owns this facility says, we're not even going to bother trying to put out the fire while it's contained to one small area of one room in this massive facility. We're just going to leave it. And his, guy, his money guy is standing there dumbfounded, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> okay, I guess. And then pretty soon the whole thing's on fire and you're just sort of feeling like, one guy with a fire extinguisher could have handled that in 30 seconds. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> Um, anyway, I just, I remember thinking that was very silly. It was. Um, yeah. I'm going to shut the lines on okay. just get something like, sure. but I can hear you, so if you yeah. want to keep, I'll just be on the right. other side. Of the well, computer. so let, let's go ahead and, and, and open up the uh, Mission Impossible discussion. And so one of the things that's a similarity right off the bat with Mission Impossible Rogue Nation and Mission Impossible Fallout is these are the first two Mission Impossible movies that share a director with uh, Christopher McQuarrie, uh, who also uh, wrote the script with, uh, with, you know, Tom Cruise and Tom Cruise's, you know, executive producing. And so, you know, every previous Mission Impossible movie had a different director. We got De Palma, we got John Woo, we got J.J. Abrams, we got Brad Bird, but now back to back, two by the same guy. And so in some respects, I feel like that's, you know, whereas what we saw with, you know, the James Bond movies this time is a lot of, over a longer period of time, of course, weaving back and forth with with tone and presentation, whereas the Mission Impossible movies have almost been like converging, right? On on this is what we do for Mission Impossible movies, um, and so tonally and in terms of presentation and characterization, Rogue Nation and Fallout are more similar to each other than any other two of the. Mission Impossible movies. Yes. 
and just as a matter of personal taste, I really like them. Yeah, me too. Uh, not that I, again, we've talked about the other Mission Impossible movies, there's ones that I really do like. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that Rogue Nation is probably my favorite. Oh, yeah? Yeah? Well, I was just yeah. going to say, last time you said that Ghost Protocol was your favorite. Yeah, now that I watched Rogue Nation, <laughs> I remember that was actually probably my favorite. Yeah. Um, Ghost Protocol is a second, and mm -hmm. then... I, I like Fallout, and we can get into this a little bit more, um, but just I'll just say I, there there is still a lot about Fallout that, yes, I get that there is obviously a, a central theme that goes through it. It still does feel more like a collection of scenes than a complete movie to me, um, even though I know it's not. I know they all matter. All those scenes are awesome, but just for whatever reason, like packaged together, it's not it's just not as good to me as, well, as Red Nation. Yeah. I I like it more, but I, I feel like I can see what you're saying. Um, I And one of the things that I really, uh, really struck me watching these two back to back is that I originally saw them three years apart, right? Like I saw Rogue Nation when it was in the theaters, but I didn't watch it again before watching Fallout. And I, you know, I would not say that of myself that I have face blindness, but I would say compared to what some other people seem capable of in terms of recognizing people, I am not as good as lots of people in that sort of thing. And so, first of all, the, you know, Sean Harris as Solomon Lane having different hair and a beard in Fallout, like, like might as well have been a completely different person as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so, like, there, like, when I was watching Fallout in the theater, like I remembered virtually nothing about like, who that guy was. And, you know, it had been three years. I hadn't thought very much about it. Like I remembered Ilsa, but had to be told, oh yeah, that's, that's who that is. Like once they said, oh, that's Ilsa Faust. I was like, oh, right. Yeah. Okay. I remember her. Um, Cause I think she's great. I think she's a fantastic addition to the franchise in, in these two movies. Um, yes. But having like so watching them back to back it's much more obvious what the through lines are between the two movies but between the two movies there is supposed to have been time passing it's supposed to be two years later in the story and i feel like watching the movies back to back helps you remember better what the threads are the connecting threads mm -hmm. but makes it feel like be, it makes that to your time jump feel a little bit awkward, right? It almost feels like you missed a, you missed those scenes where that time was supposed to have passed. Um, I that's that's what I felt a little bit watching them back to back. Like I I remembered, oh yeah, okay, this is yeah, this is exactly how those threads connect. Um, and I will say that I think the White Widow as a character feels a little bit half baked and poorly integrated with the rest of the story universe and i think that might be contributing to what you were feeling about um the uh the feeling like a collection of scenes you know what i mean like because everything that like it's one thing to have say okay we have a mission involving her but like what exactly is her deal and who's she working with i feel like there's maybe a few too many moving pieces in fallout that i think that, that's definitely one of the parts yeah mm -hmm. I, and I do think there's probably a little bit where it, it may be even a victim of its own success in the scenes is that because there are so many, like it's almost like five climaxes, mm -hmm. you know, because of how big these scenes are, yeah. you know, and, and they're all awesome. But the fact that like the way that it just feels like you, you're, you're in this like super heightened scene and then it's like on to the next super heightened scene and, it, and yeah. it's kind of, yeah. I think in, in particular, the helicopter chase leading into the big fist fight on the cliff, you know, following Ethan in that last climax, like as much as I, I love it in general, I feel like there's maybe one beat too many in it because it just it starts getting to the point where you can't maintain that level of tension. You're just getting like physiologically exhausted trying to keep up with it at all. Yeah, but but so much of the movie for me feels felt like that, you know, okay. like it's it, you know, with the breaking breaking him out and then into the whole thing of like, okay, now what do we do with him? Like, is it 
which one is him and where who's going where and and who's the good guys and who's the bad guys and who's a good guy but doing things that we don't like and all you know yeah. like just, it's, it's so ratcheted up at this high octane all the time mm-hmm. that's i think a little bit of what i was feeling too yeah uh, I, I i i tend to agree because first of all i feel like like i was saying i think the white widow like nothing against the actress but i just feel like the script doesn't really like what is her deal actually she's Originally, we think she is another sort of character, maybe a bit like Lashif in the sense that she's she does arms dealers. She's a broker. She arranges uh, buyers to meet sellers, and and she's certainly involved with all these really dangerous people. But then later we discover, oh wait, no, actually she is working with the CIA. And do we do we like her or not? Because like there's a whole bit in the like the the denouement where it's like, oh yeah, no, we arranged for Solomon. Uh, Lane to uh, get turned over to the MI6, you know, through a power broker, and it's and it's her, and and I'm like, are we supposed to be happy about that? I don't even remember what we think about her. Um, yeah. yeah, so I agree, and then I think also the the sequence where we, I think, up to where we discover, con- you know, get confirmation that um, Henry Cavill, you know, Agent Walker is is John Lark. Up to like that point, I think that scene is really cool. But then it like, oh, and we discover, oh, and you know, uh, you know, his boss Sloane is on the phone, and so now she knows. Except wait, she actually still doesn't trust anybody. So we're coming to you, and the power goes out, and there's a bunch of people like, we're, like, oh, I, I guess that's the CIA. But wait, some of them work for Walker, and like, there's just like there's a little bit too much going on there, I think. Yeah, that's, you're, you're definitely tapping into exactly what I was thinking. And each, each one of those things in isolation is, is an entertaining scene. It's just when you thread them all together, it feels like a bunch of scenes threaded together. And, Mm -hmm. you know, for example, I mean, I, like I said, I think the the part where I really started to feel it was you have the escape scene or the breakout scene which is really cool because it's like, you know, and, but again, it's, it's clouded by the, what does this white widow have to kind of do with it? I guess it's because her brother is the one that has the plan, but we have this whole, here's the plan. Mm-hmm. And then Ethan has this sub plan to get away from the plan because, yeah. you know, he doesn't want Solomon to be able to recognize him, but then ultimately he takes Solomon's hood off because well, I guess it's because he thought he was shot in the face. Well, right. Yeah. He had to, he had to confirm. Well, and also, I mean, the concern yeah, there. Yeah. The idea is still that he went through all this trouble to only end up in the same place. And I get yeah. why they were doing that, but that, that feels like it's whole thing. And then you go right into the scene you were talking about. Like it's yeah. not that much further down when it's like, you find out that all these people have all these different sort of allegiances, but you're not really sure what they are that's like maybe 10 minutes later. And it's just like, mm-hmm. it's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, you know, and then you go into the Ethan running a lot. I, I think I, I yeah. joked about, you know, which I, I love that though. I, I, I love that sequence. Yeah. But it's now a thing where we need to like that. Actually, we need to, need to add that into mission impossible. Canon is that Ethan running at full speed with like the Olympic sprinter style with like the, you know, the straight hands is like a thing that's part of the franchise now. You know, yeah. there's always going to well, be a scene where you're printing at something. You know? I mean, but this <laughs> is not the first movie that that happens, right? Like that's, that's been, what I'm saying. Like yeah. we now need to add that because it, because now that I've recognized that it happens in every one of the movies. Yeah. Like it has to be now part of what makes a Mission Impossible. Movie oh yeah, is- no, I I agree completely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah he definitely. Uh, there, there have been several movies that have entire set pieces that are clearly centered around. Let's have Ethan run a long way really fast yeah um you know that's like there's there's whole sequences that are clearly designed in order to showcase that um i love the one in here too but it's again it's just one more thing where it's like it's such a heightened emotional tension that when you just these things just keep coming and coming and coming and then you go to the helicopter scene and then the fist fight and then the bombs being need to be diffused and like there's just so much that's Mm -hmm. happening that it it Again, it just feels like a collection of awesome scenes, um, even though they do have a, a, a perfectly legitimate through line for the most part. Like you said, there's some weird things here and there where you're like, well, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, I, I think I think it's true that when we like. 
what we need in any action movie is we have the big exciting sequences and then we need a little bit of a break, right? But I think it's true that in Fallout, most of the breaks still feel uncomfortable because we're not 100% sure what's going on. So we don't get as much of that release of tension as, as we might ideally like. And then once everything ramps up again, we don't actually feel, it doesn't entirely feel like a different sequence. Yeah, it's like it's like a hard workout where you don't take enough rest between sets, mm-hmm. you know? and so you get end up more fatigued than you should because you never got to recover. Yeah, so yeah. I, I I I agree with all of that. Um, I think that the things that I really like about it, though, for me, more than make up for those, but I, I definitely see what you're saying uh, about those, and even agree. Well, and like I said, I think it's still it's probably tied with one at my, as my third favorite. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, yeah. I, I kind of have it equal because the one has just got kind of a special place. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I have a hard time ranking things like this. I just, I tend to think more of like, I, I like all of them. Um, but yeah, so let, let's briefly, let's mm-hmm. talk about, um, you know, the, the storyline is really in these two, more than any of the other comparative ones we've got, we've got like a, a through line really between these two movies. So we finished Ghost Protocol with Ethan becoming aware that there is this shadowy organization called the Syndicate, might as well be Spectre, right? You know, it's like, you know, that's where we see, you know, some of the James Bond stuff, right? That's, you know, influence in Mission Impossible. Um, But, you know, this idea that there is this ultra secret organization that is trying to do these various terrorist strikes. And so uh, in Rogue Nation, um, Ethan is convinced that this is happening. He is trying to track down this guy. And in particular, we get a fun reversal where it turns out he's trying to get his new mission, but the, the, you know... uh, Solomon Lane has has gotten to the message first and tweaks it so that it's, you know, it, that that is an overcomplicated super villain move for sure, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, it's like I'm actually going to hack into your special little mission IMF computer so that it'll play my message instead of theirs, and then I'm going to just shoot the lady who you gave the code phrase to, um, and then gas you, and then I guess torture you. Like there's there's a lot of overthinking there, right? <laughs> but at the same time, it's establishing that that's kind of who this guy is. He's this very sort of um, cool, soft-spoken um, weirdo that, uh, despite having that sort of very reserved demeanor, is actually a, a, a very strange person. <laughs> yes, like they they basically you know, to get into the James Bond similarity, like they give him permission to be theatrical. Yeah. And, you know, how he's like, I mean, and it's in every one of his scenes, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, he's every, everything in Rogue Nation. And then when he's finally free in Fallout and he, he can have actually be on his own to his own devices or whatever, he's doing the same things. Like mm-hmm. it's all theatrics. Like it's all, you know, the, yeah. whole, the, I mean, the whole concept of like, I'm going to, cause i'm going to get ethan's former wife to do a mission in a town where i can blow up this glacier which is going to yeah. also cause a water shortage in every in in the planet while killing ethan's wife and i need to get ethan to track her there so that he is also there to see this happen yeah there is definitely an <laughs> element to which all of the characters have just completely established as a given that he knows everything and has a plan for everything. And no matter what happens, it's according to his plan. And you're just sort of assuming that as a given in whatever decisions you make. Um, They do a great job of like mm -hmm. making it feel like that's what his character is. And he as well, because he is, he can play that sort of weird Mm -hmm. guy. You're like, okay. I mean, I, I, Yes. One one of my favorite bits from him in um, Rogue Nation is where uh, Ilsa has come to report to him after the opera house, and um, 
he basically explains that she is screwed up twice now and she says are you questioning my loyalty or my capability and he says can't decide <laughs> Uh, I, that's a that's a good bit, uh, but then of course he he does the classic supervillain move of shooting his own guy to show how tough and badass he is. Um, immediately afterwards, <laughs> um, but yeah, like he is totally a Bond style supervillain of a type that we really haven't had in any of the Mission Impossible movies so far, right? Like you know we talked a little bit about how Philip Seymour Hoffman's character in three was more of the no name, you know, more of like a defined character villain. And some of the other Mission Impossible movies tended to have almost sort of a blank stand in villain, right? You know, yeah. where it wasn't or I guess that's well, we talked a little bit about that where it's the the villain was not the interesting character. Um, but in this case, uh, what, what you know, we have him as a through line, you know, like, so in Rogue Nation, it's all about Ethan knows this guy is out there trying to track him down, but the CIA has forced um, the IMF to be shuttered. Um, Alec Baldwin plays a CIA guy who is leading this charge to say, nope, IMF, they're, you know, loose cannons. We don't like that. We are going to try to track them down, bring them in because they're causing devastation wherever they go. Which, frankly, from the outside perspective, is an entirely reasonable position to take. Um, <laughs> um, and although it's a funny running gag with Jeremy Renner just refusing to answer any of the questions by saying, you know, I can't answer any questions without permission of the secretary, and I, you haven't appointed one, so nah, fuck you, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that's a fun gag, but he also is not really helping the IMF's case when he says that stuff, right? You know, but in any case, that's happening. So it's this cat and mouse game. They're trying to track down Ethan. He's trying to prove that he's not after this, you know, phantom organization. He they're real and that he's trying to stop them. And eventually he is sort of able to prove it in a in a. You know, the the mask scene we get in Rogue Nation is where it turns out he is posed as the head of the MI6 so that he can establish, oh, no, Syndicate is actually super real and British intelligence knows about it. And um, we can persuade Alec Baldwin to be on our side. And then we've got to try to and then they capture Solomon Lane was the big the big finish there. But then in 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 Fallout. It's two years later. He's been captured, but his syndicate is still doing its thing without him. And in fact, has actually, you know, one of the things we established about him is that he's not really a true believer or is he? I think it movie Fallout gets a little bit wishy-washy with that because I think in Rogue Nation, they're kind of trying to say that it is really more about the money for him. Um but then in Fallout, it seems like maybe after being interrogated nonstop for two years, he's maybe he's, he believes it more, <laughs> which, you know, frankly, <laughs> you could imagine why that might be. Um, yeah, I, and that part, I, I, I believe that transition mm -hmm. because, it, it, you know, well, it didn't really like say this other than the, the fact that he was being interrogated, but like he's now been stripped of all power and all mm -hmm. money and, and, and realizes like, that he still has these desires. Like, I think like you could see why it's almost like, like how, how they kind of call it. Like they, they refer to the syndicate as like the, the, the bad IMF or the counter mm -hmm. IMF. Like it's almost like a, like a counter monk experience, yeah. you know, like he's basically turned into a monk, but from a very negative way. And so his enlightenment is that he really does just like chaos. <laughs> well, I, well, and I think, I think what, what it really becomes for him is that he just becomes obsessed with revenge against Ethan Hunt personally. Right. right. And I, and I actually really love the dynamic that, uh, you know, Walker, AKA John Lark is someone who is actually a true believer in this whole, you know, must bring about suffering in order to have peace thing. Right. Like he really sincerely believes that and is utterly exasperated with Solomon Lane, who he thinks of as like, you had this great idea to do all this cool stuff. And now you're making it 
more likely that our plan will fail because you are more obsessed with getting your revenge on Tom Cruise than on doing the part that I care about to the point where we might not pull it off because of that. And I could just shoot him, but you say no. And him being exasperated during that. I, I kind of love that dynamic, actually. <laughs> You know, this whole thing of like, like my idealistic obsession was literally inspired by what you did. But then when I actually got involved with you, I realized you don't actually care about any of that. And yet I still depend on you because everyone else is obsessed with you. <laughs> um, I, I kind of like all of that. Um, I, I think... Um, I think Henry Cavill as as Walker is a, a fun um, secondary antagonist. You know, uh, you could say was he primary? He's probably, I guess they become co antagonists. Really, him and Solomon, right? By the end. Well, I mean, that's part of the complicated part of this movie. You know, mm -hmm. is that there's just, yeah, there's multiple antagonists and right. and, and sub protagonists and you know and everybody. Yeah, it's just it's it's super complicated in that. But to your point. He is very good, and he's mm -hmm. very entertaining in this. Um, yeah. And you know what I what I think makes this movie work. Like I said, I, I you know I didn't want to bash it. I was just kind of telling you the things. No, that no, were, I, like, I think it's fair. I think I think those are yeah, fair criticisms. It's overall a very good movie, very entertaining. But one of the things that works so well in this movie is that you know everybody is so committed to these characters that you believe even the nonsense, like to your point, like you forgive the part where like he makes this order and like half of the guys, I guess work for him and just shoot people in the dark. And you're not yeah. really sure, but like it, it makes, you're just like, okay, well, whatever. Like that's what he, he's right. that guy who could have that happen. You know, like, and like I said, Solomon's like overly complicated reason to get everybody into this Himalayan town. Okay. Yeah. That seems like what he would want to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and like we could even buy the idea that that Walker has some of the CIA operatives working with him. Like we can understand that story point, but just how it all plays out is really confusing. And we have kind of a lengthy gunfight against people. We don't really know what their deal is. Yeah. Um, and that that I feel like goes on too long when really the parts we care about is Walker stabs Alec Baldwin um, and then, you know, he and solomon get away right like that's that's the important part of that scene um you know but uh yeah. <laughs> um but i think uh you know his introduction brings to mind brant from four right you know mm -hmm. like when he's brought in he's kind of like you know, he's a more like a rival. We're not sure what's it, what's his storyline going to be. Is this going to be like with Brant, where like, you know, we we stare each other down, we circle around each other for a little bit, but at some point we'll go through something tough together, and then we'll trust each other, and then we'll be buddies afterwards, right? Like, is that what's going to happen, or do, it goes the other way in this case, obviously? Right, and and it actually works really well that that Brant isn't in this movie, yeah, because you you have the suspension of disbelief that maybe he could be like that new yeah. version of the plan, mm -hmm. you know, like almost reintroduced via this character. Yeah. You know? I, I, it's interesting actually, just because, you know, uh, there was more of him than I remembered in rogue nation. I was say that, yeah. Cause um, you had mentioned last time that he had a very small part, which he doesn't, he's just, he's not on the field team. So it does yeah. make it feel different. Yeah. Well, he's not in any of the action sequences, really. <laughs> um, and, I, and I couldn't have argued that last yeah. time either until I rewatched this movie. And I was like, oh, I thought the same thing. I was like, man, he is, he's a pretty central character to this well, movie. Well, I think, I think what it comes down to is there's still an element to which he has, uh, like, from a production standpoint, a much smaller role. Because all of his scenes are just conversation scenes in rooms. Right. Yes. Um, he doesn't. They don't have to do elaborate stunts with him. He's not in the big action sequences and that sort of thing. So, like his time commitment to the production would have been much lower, right? right. Um, and a big part of that is because by then he was Hawkeye, right? right. And it Which we talked about last time. Yeah, yeah. That, that he kind of had to phase himself out of this because of that. And right. Um, but I, I, you know, one of the things that is interesting in fallout um that i wonder about a little bit is 
they do they they telegraph that Walker's not just an asshole but also a bad guy um, pretty early, but in kind of a blink and you'll miss it way, and then don't confirm it for sure until like half an hour later. And I'm not 100% sure why they do it like that. I don't know if I remember that part. Um, so there's a moment where, again, it's kind of a blink and you'll miss it. Basically, um, when there's the whole bathroom fight, which is great. Um, that Speaking of similarities. <laughs> <I> love it. <laughs> but, uh, similarities, I was thinking uh, as I watched it, hey, isn't it interesting that the last of both franchises that we're watching this for uh, both have bathroom fights? Because Casino Royale has the one at the beginning. Um, yeah. But in any case, so we have the bathroom fight. Um, and there, the, the whole thing is like, okay, well, um, there's a cascading series of, of problems that cause that whole thing to, that whole plan to go awry, right? But one of the ha things that happens in it is they say, okay, well, at least we've got this guy. Can we get anything off his phone? And they show, uh-oh, phone is broken. So I guess we'll take it anyway, and hopefully they can get something off of it, but we can't turn it on and look at anything. But then when we have a scene with Walker and Sloan at the airport, the phone that he gives her is not broken. Mm. So the phone that he says they got off of John Lark when he's explaining his suspicions about Ethan the phone that he gives her is not the one that they actually got off that guy. But again, the movie does not like other than having a quick shot of it where you could, you could notice that if you caught it, it doesn't highlight that. All we would know is, Oh, this could be just like, just like Brant was suspicious about what Ethan Steele was. Right. You know, so, you know, he is thinking, Actually, one of the things that I think is really cool, though, is there's so many scenes where Walker is explaining his theory of why Ethan might actually be John Lark and what would make a, such an experienced agent turn like that. And he's, he's explaining his whole theory. And we just know when we know that he's really the bad guy, he's, ex he's explaining why he turned, right? Like he's like... Oh no, it makes perfect sense, you know, after someone has killed a bunch of people in the name of a cause that they thought they believed in and then they just realized that, you know, that they didn't really actually ever care and 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 the, it's really the system that's the problem and uh yeah, no, it makes per perfect sense that someone like that would only have be able to take so much before they would just snap. And Sloane says, "Yeah, yeah, that makes sense." Yeah, it's probably Ethan and you know, he's like, "Yeah, it's probably Ethan." <laughs> and you're just like Okay, when you know it's him, it's like you can totally see him getting all worked up about what he really does believe in. <laughs> um, but you can, he's also, we know, you know, in, in rewatching, we know that he's pissed about this plan to frame Ethan because he doesn't care. He doesn't care about Ethan. That's whole, Solomon Lane's whole thing. Yep. Like he's only trying to frame Ethan because that's what Solomon wants. Like, and, and he's, you can see him pissed about it. <laughs> and I like that. It is funny. Um, Sorry, but, my dog's sitting in his dinner spot, so I'm going to oh, okay. feed him his dinner, but we can, you can All keep right. going. Well, I think we can probably go ahead and get to the point where like, let's just like, this is free for all. Now we can, we can talk bond versus mission impossible. We can just kind of, Talk about Better. all of it. Um, you want to go on your thoughts while I get to sure, this dinner? Sure, sure. Really I'll just be yeah. not on camera. So, like, you know, we, we touched on some of these already in, in our discussion briefly, but I think uh, in particular when we look at the timeline of our Bond movies, right, the three that we did this time, 1989, License to Kill, GoldenEye, 95, uh, but then Casino Royale, is, you know, obviously after all the Brosnan movies is 2006, but 2006 is, is going to be coming after, let's see, I think Mission Impossible 3 is the one that would have just come out. Um, let's see, um, Mission Impossible 3 was 2006, so that was the same year as, as Casino Royale, but I feel like 
if we're looking at Craig's version of Bond compared to past incarnations of Bond, we've certainly had, like with Dalton, the idea of, you know, oh, he's a bit more brutal and all of that sort of thing. But at the same time, it's one thing to be brutal, but then still just sort of ruthlessly effective. But I think Craig's Bond they feel more willing to have him get beat to crap and have things go wrong for him more than previous Bonds. And I think that's maybe where you start seeing some of the influence from Mission Impossible feeding over a little bit. Yeah. Which is interesting, actually, though, just because Mission Impossible 2 would have been the one that came out before, and that's the one where Ethan is arguably most Bond-like out of the whole franchise. So maybe they both made that kind of transition at the same time due to the time. You know, maybe they, they independently came up with that idea of uh, the hero being more vulnerable mm -hmm. to those things as yeah. opposed to like truly crossing over but both taking the same tactic with their protagonist. Right. Because certainly, you know, we talked a little bit about Craig, you know, when, even when he's getting tortured, he's making jokes. But we also have the sequence where he gets poisoned, right? And he handles that pretty well considering, but it's also true that, like, there's whole sequences there where he, he does not look good. And not only that, but he would have failed had not Vesper saved him, right? Like, you know, the little thing got disconnected and he was going to put it back in, but he didn't manage to quite get it. It's actually a little bit like um, Ethan getting saved by Ilsa in the underwater sequence of, of Rogue Nation, right? You know, it's like, That's fun. hmm? That's such a fun sequence. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I, I had a friend who was complaining about, it's like, that's not how where you store servers. And I'm like, the whole idea is that it's impossible to get to. Like, that's the concept of it. Like, it's like, you know, oh, it's, it's not about uh, being just a heat sink or something. Um, but in any event, uh, yeah, I, I like that sequence. Um, uh, but like in terms of similarities, you know, like we have, we have Vesper in Casino Royale where she is very capable in her own way. She doesn't do quite the same things that Bond does, but she is very capable in her own way and that she is complicated in terms of her motivations and our feelings about her. We mostly like her, but it's a little bit unclear what she's up to, especially by the end. And then you look at Ilsa Faust introduced in Rogue Nation and then returning in, in Fallout. Like, I think she's very cool. I love her character. I like that she is kind of a match for Ethan, but at the same time, we're never quite 100% sure what her deal is. Right, because she 100% she has her own motivations, mm -hmm. which makes her kind of cool. And like, because, yeah. you know, she's... you. And they do a very good job of showing that, like, yeah, they have, like, an affinity for each other, mm -hmm. but they, they, we are, it, it, it almost, like, reminds us that we are so focused on Ethan's side of the story because that's our protagonist mm -hmm. that we miss it just like, like, it's confusing to us just like it's confusing to him. Like, he's so, he's so mission driven and so are we because we only know his mission. And then when this other person comes who has like different motivations and doesn't seem to be doing exactly what we want them to be doing, but we're not, it, it makes it very confusing for us, but mm -hmm. it, it, it's always explained, but it's always explained in like, Oh, well it's because she's trying to do what her mission is and like what's best for her. Right. And I, I really love that kind of like piece to it. You know, mm -hmm. that if we were watching a different movie, Ethan would be the one where we were like, what does this guy keep doing with these elaborate like counter plans and like yeah. nonsense, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you know, we get some of those fun exchanges, like, you know, Walker saying hope is not a strategy. And she's like, you must be new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, but, and, and then of course, like we get the, that, that amazing, um, you know, the, the, the showdown during the action sequence and then later the calmer conversation in Fallout where it, it's, it, what it comes down to is neither of them are doing, like, a bad thing, but the problem is they ha their governments, their respective governments have opposing motivations that, again, are not, like, neither of them is 
exactly bad. I mean, I think I think we're we would be inclined to be more on the U.S.'s side in this of saying, well, we're going to try to find out the truth about what this guy's doing, whatever it is, with the MI6 actually saying, no, he's embarrassing because he's kind of a failed experiment from our side, and we don't want anyone else to know that. So, like, that's less <laughs> altruistic for sure. But at the same time, from Ilsa's perspective, we can understand why, like, she's feeling like, I don't, I don't even like that they want me to do that, but it's the only choice I have. You know, it's one, you know, I, it's one thing that I think the movie goes, it goes back on. It, it's a little bit wishy-washy about the idea of like, she's like, oh, well, I would be on the run. Um, you know, I, I could never really be free, but she had also basically tried to claim that Ethan should have gone with her at the end of Rogue Nation, which like, I believe it, but it's a little bit like, could she really have been free? I, you know what? Honestly, it's not important. Like, like that sort of thing. It's not <laughs> the key of what we like about her character. The key is that she's, she feels like a real match for, for Ethan that, by circumstance, occasionally file, finds herself with, at, you know, at cross purposes with him. Um, and so, like, do we trust her? What's she doing? What's she up to? That sort of thing. So, like, just the fact that, like, she shows up out of nowhere, apparently, in the middle of their op trying to get John Lark. And it's like, okay, saves his life, but also renders his original plan completely unusable. Um, and also basically telling him, you don't know what you're in for here. You need to leave right now. And he's like, uh, I can't do that. So they're both kind of suddenly in a position of, we're both kind of trying to make our original plan work, even though we sort of both mutually know that, that neither of those is actually possible anymore. So I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I, I think she's she's very cool. But I think that we can see some uh, similarity, um, just tonally. I think in the relationship between Ethan and Ilsa compared to Bond and Vesper in Casino yeah. Royale. Um, I, you know, we talked already a little bit about the idea of that Solomon Lane as this bad guy, who is, you know initially just about doing all sorts of like terrorism money deals in order to reap financial windfalls and kind of cloaking it all in some sort of a higher ideology and then becoming obsessed with revenge against the hero like that's golden eye in casino royale and then also solomon lane in in um rogue nation and fallout right like very similar um, I think that's kind of cool, <laughs> or I mean, it's, it's an interesting similarity there. I, I think what that kind of maybe comes to a little bit is there is, I think, a problem for some of these kinds of movies of a greater awareness that it's maybe not great. There's not as many sort of nations that you can sort of just decide that are the bad guys in in these sorts of movies anymore you know it's like it, it you know during the cold war it was fine for all sorts of movies to just say no the russians are the bad guys period that's fine you can have them be the bad guys all you want they can do all the bad things and if you're making a world war ii movie obviously you've got the nazis but like today it's a lot harder to try to have any specific nation be the bad guys. Um, so what you have to kind of do is try to conjure up some sort of a, you know, a non-nationalized threat. And so I think that you see that happening in kind of both of these franchises. Um, you know, because, you know, it's not in Casino Royale, but obviously Craig's Bond movies have progressed to introducing, reintroducing Spectre as this same kind of, you know, it's the syndicate or it's, uh, you know, whatever, any other 
super non-nationalized uh, secret supervillain organization, right? In in any of these kinds of movies. Um, yep. I mean, like Spectre in the original Bonds. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, but I, yeah, so I don't know if I, I, I felt like I was trying to circle to some larger point, but I, it kind of ran out of steam there. Um, I feel like that was a really astute point is that these, these movies, you know, I think you use the word like a convergence, primarily referring to the Mission Impossible movies in that they were kind of converging onto a style. Mm hmm. The reality, I think, is that both of these franchises are converging, and that's why we start to see a lot more similarities. And probably a lot of what sparked us even doing this, you know, because when we, at the beginning, you know, yeah, we could find some similarities between Mission Impossible and James Bond. I mean, they were both spy movies; they had some things in common. Um, but the early Mission Impossibles versus the early James Bonds, partly because they're separated by decades, mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't have as many. But now, now as the movies are coming into where they're being made at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, they're they're converging on how their themes come because that's how you make movies now. And and I think that point is very salient. That you know, and, and I don't know that this was the last one, but I feel like. Um, True Lies might have been the last movie that really was able, that, like, I think it was cri very cri criticized very broadly for utilizing, you know, Islam mm -hmm. as, like, the bad guys. And it, and at that time, like, you could see why it would be going that way, and because that's, you know, that's where the 9-11 attacks came from, and that's where this are. But the fact to paint, you know, people started to realize, like, you shouldn't paint an entire people as just terrorists. Mm hmm because of this one thing or a couple of a couple of incidences when it's you know one of the largest religions in the world and most of them are not doing these things mm -hmm. and and now that just the way that media is shared and and, and co-opted this is not it's just not okay to do that anymore because it, it paints a too broad a brush right. and i feel like that was kind of like the last movie that was really able to do that and then it, and then yeah you see you know in the mid 2000s you start to see this convergence onto you know, these more, you know, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, you describe it the best. So it, it where it's these, <laughs> it's, it's non-nationalist, yeah. non-religious bad guys. Like how do you create that? And, and having to be creative in how you create who is the, the villain, mm -hmm. you know, it's part of probably part of why super movie, super movie, uh, 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 movies, be, so I keep saying super movies. Yeah, superhero <laughs> super the, yeah. movies. I don't know why I couldn't get that out. Superhero movies have became so popular is because those bad guys work like that. You know, mm -hmm. they don't they don't tie to any particular nation or people right. and paint that broad brush. And that's why we're seeing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so the creativity that they're doing to 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 get to that level of villain is interesting. And both these movies, like you said. I think the convergence is there as well as, you know, just within the Mission Impossible. Um, one of the things that is certainly a theme in, um, like, you can, you can actually see some of it in, in GoldenEye, even though, like, it, the movie sort of trended away from it again, and then it gets reset a little bit in Casino Royale. And then definitely in the Mission Impossible movies is this awareness that the U.S. and British governments, respectively, um, not always done the best things. Um, and a, 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 a sort of a raising of the question of, like, it's one thing for, like, in a, a lot of Bond's history, for Queen and Country, it's a patriotic thing. You're doing this for the good old U.K. And, uh, and you could have lots of uh, movies where that would have been true for, you know, the U.S. too, right? Um, but like you see some of this, like it's established in GoldenEye, the whole idea there, there's a sort of a weird through line that like, oh gosh, turns out that Sean Bean's character actually was part of this like Cossack, uh, group, um, that was, uh, betrayed by the British government and they thought he was, you know, he was orphaned by that whole thing and, uh, they thought he was too young, but in... And like establish, and it's like it's it's framing the seed of his desire for revenge against the UK in this historical betrayal that the UK 
perpetrated, right? And then likewise, we, although, you know, Ethan doesn't ever actually betray the U.S., there's certainly questions raised about the idea that sometimes the U.S. doesn't always do the good stuff, you know, and like the IMF is kind of framed as like, they're the ones that are actually always on the right side, but sometimes the CIA, they do bad things, you know, um, even though obviously the first Mission Impossible movie was literally about the, the head of the IMF force having this exact same break where he feels like he doesn't like being told what to do anymore. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think that you start to see like this, and this is happening in the superhero movies too, where there's this increased awareness that governments, even your own, are not actually always making the right decisions and historically might have made some real bad ones. And there being this sort of awareness of that and a feeling like you have to sort of acknowledge that, but also not willing to really commit to saying that the government is bad. Right. Um, and so I think that there is a lot of that really becoming part of the simmering zeitgeist for that any of these movies have to exist in. Um, you know, like you either have to say, okay, well, we'll acknowledge that there were some past missteps, but we're, we're better now, but maybe haven't paid for those mistakes enough or, uh, you know, are they still bad and who says so? And, you know, a lot of that I think is in the stew, uh, that all of these movies need to exist in now. Yeah, which is a, a really good counterbalance to the villain part of it is that, mm -hmm. you know, they take out the completely puristic motives of the, you know, our protagonist's government, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so it, it, it very much complements uh, the the way that the, they're establishing the villains. So, yeah, no, I think those are both good observations as well. So. Well, uh, one last thought on that is that I think... Although I certainly think Casino Royale is a better movie than Spectre, um, and I'm glad we watched it instead of Spectre. Not to just trash Spectre, but I mean, I think between the two, I know which one I prefer by a significant margin. Um, I think in talking about some of this stuff, it's almost a shame that we don't have a more aligned time period movie, right? Like, you know, Fallout came out in 2018. Casino Royale was 2006. Yeah. So, like, we don't really have the most recent Bond movie to directly compare. So I think some of this, you know, we don't have the one for one exactly. But, you know, overall, I, I think it's been really fun to just talk about these two franchises in this way. Like, do you have anything? Well, I would, oh? I would I, well, that was what I was going to say is I, I then propose that once the new one does come out that we watch that mm -hmm. and when we review that movie we we insert it back into this conversation you know as opposed to just watching it on its own mm -hmm. well and then I, for that matter here. we by uh but, you know we're by the time that comes out we're expecting a, another mission impossible later this year too so oh so maybe yeah maybe we should wait and revisit and watch both and then yeah. do a a, a, a part four. Yeah. No, I like that. So once we have one, you know, the the newest of the two that we're still waiting on. I like it. Cool. I like that. Um, all right. So I think, do you have any sum ups that you want to cover uh, for all this before we kind of um, transition into the outro? No, I just, I, my only sum summary is that I, I really enjoyed this kind of a different way of us going about our movie watching. Mm -hmm. um, it was just an interesting kind of mental exercise, like watching them with the different perspectives while they were all movies. I enjoyed rewatching, like watching them with this like take made it just a different viewing experience. It almost made the rewatching a little bit more interesting. Mm hmm. I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I, I don't know what, you know, and again, I don't want to do this every time because there are other things that we want to watch, but this kind of experiment, if we can find another one that's similar to this at some point, like I really did, I, I, I just enjoyed going through it, so. Yeah, I, I 
I'm I'm glad that you did. I did too. And uh, yeah, so we'll we'll think more in the future about um, possible uh, experiments, more experiments like this to do, rather than just saying, "Hey, let's pick two movies." Although yeah. we'll do that sometimes too. But I think for our next episode, there's a whole new slate of Oscar nominations to uh, to talk about. And it's a weird year because obviously a lot of big tentpole movies didn't come out or got delayed because of COVID. Uh, people are not seeing movies in the theaters like they usually do because of COVID. Um, and then on top of all of that, related, possibly, hard to say, but the slate of nominated movies continues a trend that we've seen for the last couple of years, which is just increasing focus on smaller movies that maybe a lot of people haven't seen. And so I think a lot of people are in the same boat of having really not seen very many of the nominees. Yeah. So this will be really interesting, but it also means that a lot of the nominees are very accessible mm -hmm. um, because a lot of them never went to the theater. A lot of them are available to stream. Um, so there's more of an opportunity um, to see a lot of the movies than maybe there was in the past without having to always commit to going to the theater or mm -hmm. finding a theater like a lot, especially a lot of those movies that were in that transition phase, like during the Oscars yeah. where they had been a theatrical release, but they weren't quite on video yet. Right. Those were yeah. very tough to find, you know? Right. Um, so there's some excitement about that and, and the accessibility of the movies, but yeah, it's, 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 it's just going to be an interesting year um, mm -hmm. to go through that. So, yeah. All right, so I think our next episode will will be talking about that. But uh, in the meantime, uh, thank you to everyone, uh, whether you're watching us on video or listening to the podcast version. Thank you, um, and uh, we'll we'll be back to uh, talk more about the Oscars uh, soon. So in the meantime, uh, watch good movies, maybe some of the Oscar-nominated ones. I agree.